We introduced hypothesis testing in module number eight. It's usually impossible or impractical for a researcher to observe every individual in a population. Therefore, researchers usually collect data from a sample and then use the sample data to help answer questions about the population. Hypothesis testing is a statistical procedure that allows researchers to use sample data to draw inferences about the population of interest. It's one of the most commonly used inferential procedures. In this module, the primary goal that we want you to achieve is to be able to choose appropriate tests for a given research situation. To help you do this, there are basically two things to consider. Number one, is your data parametric or non-parametric? Or in other words, is it normally distributed or not? And secondly, the number of groups being compared. One, two, or more than two. This flowchart outlines the decision process to reach the appropriate hypothesis test. In the past, it was important to understand the mathematics and equations involved in each test because they were calculated manually with pen and paper. In the age of widespread computers and statistical software, it's more important to be able to recognize which hypothesis test you should be choosing to apply to your data so as to avoid an erroneous or misleading conclusion. For t-tests and ANOVA tests, the maths and equations are focused on comparing means from sample groups before and after an experimental intervention. They are how we answer the question, did the manipulation of the independent variable cause a statistically significant change in the dependent variable? t-tests are appropriate when only two means are being compared either a sample mean versus a population mean, or one sample mean with a second sample mean. The latter could be a comparison of the same sample group before and after an intervention, or a comparison between two distinct sample groups. There are distinct types of t-tests for those three situations, with different underlying mathematics. The one sample t-test, the dependent t-test, which is also known as a paired t-test, and lastly the independent t-test, also known as the unpaired test. If you want to compare the effect of an intervention in more than two sample means, then you should be choosing an ANOVA test instead. ANOVA stands for Analysis of Variance. The term analysis in statistics means to break down. There are also distinct types of ANOVA for different study designs. The three that we want you to learn to recognize are the one-way independent ANOVA, the one-way repeated measures ANOVA, and the two-way ANOVA. The one-way and two-way language refers to the number of independent variables that have been manipulated in the experiment, one for one-way and two for two-way. Another name for the independent variable when talking about ANOVA is factor, so we can legitimately also refer to these tests as the one-factor independent ANOVA, the one-factor repeated measures ANOVA, and the two-factor ANOVA. It's possible to have multiple independent variables, i.e. more than two factors. The test for this design is called a factorial ANOVA. Their design and application are complex and beyond the scope of the SRCC biostatistics curriculum. Another special ANOVA term is level. Levels are the degrees of manipulation of the independent variable. For example, a study that examined the effect of a new drug at three different doses would have three levels of the factor. It's worth having a small sense of how the approach and underlying maths work for t-tests compared to ANOVA. For t-tests, the maths and stats equations are focused on comparing the actual difference in sample means before and after an experimental intervention with the difference expected by chance alone. In other words, does our manipulation of the independent variable cause the central tendency of the dependent variable to increase, decrease, or stay the same. T-tests quantify this as a single numerical value called a T-statistic. Whereas ANOVA is focused on comparing the extent of variance in sample means before and after an experimental intervention with the difference expected by chance alone. Or in other words, did our manipulation of the independent variable cause the standard deviation of the dependent variable to increase, decrease, or stay the same. 
ANOVA quantifies this as a single numerical value called an F-ratio. The F-ratio is really just comparing the variance between treatment groups with the variance within those groups. The variance between treatment groups is composed of the differences due to the treatment effect of the independent variable being manipulated, as well as the individual differences of the study participants and differences due to chance. Whereas the variance within treatment groups is made up of just the individual differences of the study participants and those due to chance. As I said before, ANOVA stands for Analysis of Variance, and the term analysis in statistics means to break down. ANOVA breaks down or analyzes data in the following way. It takes the total variability of a data set and separates out and quantifies the between treatments and within treatments variance. Analysis of between treatments variance starts by quantifying how different samples A, B and C are from one another. Whereas the analysis of the within treatments variance starts by quantifying how different individuals within a given sample group are from one another. Further analysis breaks down the between and within treatment variances to allow us to separate out and quantify the effect of the treatment, individual differences and chance. Because the individual differences and differences due to chance feature in both the numerator and denominator of the F ratio, if we know their numerical values, we can cancel them out leaving us with a measure of just the treatment effect. Let's look at how this would play out in two scenarios. Firstly, let's consider a situation where your manipulation of the independent variable has no effect. We'll therefore assign it the numerical value of 0. The individual differences have a value of 10, and the contribution from chance alone has a value of 5. I'm just making these numbers up for the sake of illustration, in reality, the ANOVA test in your statistical software would derive the pertinent values from your starting data set. Here, the F ratio would simplify down to 1, and we would use p-values to interpret this result in the conventional way, and accept or fail to accept the null hypothesis accordingly. If, on the other hand, your manipulation of the independent variable does have a genuine effect, what happens? Again, let me make up some numbers for the sake of illustration. Let's say the treatment effect has a value of 155, and we'll keep the values of 10 and 5 for the individual differences and those due to chance. Here, the F ratio would simplify down to 11.33. And again, we would use p-values to interpret this result in the conventional way and accept or fail to accept the null hypothesis accordingly. ANOVA compares all the individual sample group mean differences simultaneously within a single test. Unfortunately, when you obtain a significant F ratio and therefore fail to accept the null hypothesis, it simply indicates that somewhere among the entire set of mean differences, there's at least one that's statistically significant. In other words, the overall F ratio only tells you that a significant difference exists. It does not tell exactly which individual sample groups are significantly different and which are not. Post hoc tests are additional hypothesis tests that are done after an ANOVA to determine exactly which mean differences are significant and which are not. Data that are observations of nominal or ordinal scales or have deviations in skew or kurtosis are not normally distributed and therefore non-parametric. If you have data that's non-parametric and you wish to compare means, then you would go through the same decision process but switch to an equivalent non-parametric test with different underlying mathematics. For data where you want to compare differences in proportion between samples rather than means, we want you to know about these two test options, the chi-square test and Fisher's exact test. Here are three examples. How does the number of surgeons who are women compare with the number who are men? Of the two leading brands of NSAID, which is preferred by most Americans? In the past 10 years, has there been a significant change in the proportion of non-traditional medical students matching in the specialty of their choice? Note that each of the examples asks a question about proportions in the population. We're not measuring a numerical score for each individual. 
Instead, the individuals are simply classified into categories and we want to know what proportion of the population is in each category. The data for these sorts of tests are usually organised into something called a contingency table, big enough to accommodate all the individual sample groups involved. The 2x2 two two tables we've used for sensitivity and specificity calculations are examples of contingency tables. There, the table represents the proportion of positive and negative test results in relation to disease status. Let's look at another example. If we were investigating whether there's a relationship between extroversion and introversion and the amount of weekly exercise a person gets, we might represent or gather data in this contingency table. We have 100 study participants who are proportionally categorised into six boxes or cells in the contingency table. The chi-square test can be used for research studies with large sample sizes whereas the Fisher's exact test should be used for small sample sizes. If we return to our introversion-extroversion example, the values in each cell of the contingency table are large enough to warrant the use of the chi-square test. If, on the other hand, the data looked like this, then we would switch to Fisher's exact test. A good rule of thumb to help you decide when a sample size is too small for chi-square is that when the value of any individual cell of a contingency table is less than 5, you should use a Fisher's exact test.